Let's see here. Is there a reason why, hey, Rit, is there a reason why that's popping up here? I uh, never had it before. Yeah, neither there have I. We here we go. All right, here we go. Let me do this really, really quickly. All right, guys, welcome to a special edition of Front Row Material. My name is Mike Freeland. I am joined on location uh, by the Rit himself. Rit, how you doing, buddy? Hey, not bad. Uh, you know, when you sit there and you, you got a phenomenal guest like, you know, Mr. Canadian Destroyer, P.D. Williams, and he gives, says, hey, I got some free time. You put a vacation for it. So you can't miss this. Absolutely. And we are so happy to bring that to you guys. And this is going to be a YouTube exclusive as well. So, you know, without any further ado, let's go ahead and let's bring him in. Uh, the man who has changed the face of wrestling. Uh, and so many times I see the move, uh, PD, and I'm like, man, the man who made it what it is today, PD Williams. How you doing, buddy? Uh, how's she going, eh? Uh, I'm doing good. <laughs> Wow, it's a pleasure to have you on here, my friend. So kind of before we get going, how's life been treating you? Um, obviously, now that wrestling is getting back going again post-pandemic. Uh, yeah, good. I mean, I took the pandemic off. Uh, you know, my last match prior to the pandemic, we were in, uh, it was against Moose. We were getting built up for that big uh, TNA reunion show for WrestleMania 35, I think it was that year, 36 or something like that. I think 36. Um, and you know, then the pandemic happened and then I wasn't wrestling. And then I, uh, Scott contacted me, Scott Demore contacted me in December and he was like, Hey, you ready to come back? And I said, I'll oh, give me a few weeks. And I was back for the January taping. And it was the first time I wrestled, uh, on purpose, uh, in front of no fans. And, uh, you know, it was weird. It's, I would say less stressful. Um, Cause it's more like shooting a movie, I guess. If you mess up, then it's like, hold on time out. Let's do this again. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so now the fans are going to be back. I'm super excited. It's been, uh, almost two, it's been a year and a half since I wrestled in front of any people live. Wow. So that that's, uh, that's exciting. Yeah, it is. No, it absolutely is because, you know, as much as you, like you said before, you can redo something, there's nothing like feeding off of an audience and getting the blood pumping. And we've talked to several people that they've kind of echoed those same sentiments, how sometimes to get amped, you actually have to do a little bit more now. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, you walk out there and you're like, okay, it, it, you're almost just going off a of muscle memory, you know, like when, when you hit a move or when you do what you got to do and, uh, you know, normally that's when you would play to the crowd, play to the camera. The cameras are still there. And, you know, we were taught uh, at a very, you know, very early on in my career at Impact. Um, you know, Terry Taylor said like, and you'll see it. You'll see people that aren't uh, trained to be on TV because they'll always uh, look at the camera like this. You know, and they'll just like face away and do that kind of thing, play into the crowd which it's awesome for the crowd, but for the, you know, potential millions of people at home watching, it doesn't make sense. We're like, why does he have my back? Why does he have his back turned to me? So we learned very early, you know, steel chairs are props. The rings a prop, you know, this belt that I'm carrying is a prop. The, the, the gears props, uh, the fans behind you, they're props. They're there to make noise. They, you know, and that's what we learned. So, I mean, the camera's there. Uh, it's still, it's tough. Cause you don't understand, like if you're doing something right and you want to call an audible in the ring, it, cause the, the fans are feeling it, then you do it when there's no fans. You're like, I, I think this is when I would move on to the next move. It's just, it's so different and it, it just, it feels so weird, but I think I, I gotta give credit to all the talent in the back. Like they, they pulled it off really good as if there was, was fans in the crowd. So, well, you're back in the impact wrestling, but also you were there in the beginning of TNA, you know, the early years, team Canada, you know, Scott, the more leading the charge. Now he's the boss, you know, well, what's the difference is there? Um, I, I mean, there's, I would say a big difference. Um, you know, like back in the TNA, we were trying to make a, a name for ourselves. We're bringing in all these, you know, legends and other names and stuff like that. And, just trying to do everything we can to like kind of put our, you know, the TNA name on the map. Even when we went down to Florida and we started our TV show on, on Fox sports and that same thing, we we're all super excited. And, 
you know, go in and, you know, we built this thing together. We felt like we were like a, like a team, like a family. And then slowly but surely they started bringing in like, you know, they started bringing in like the nothing against any of these, any like uh, big fans of them all, but like, you know, Kurt Angle, Christian, all those guys. And then it's like, okay, they have to cut some of the roster to make room, you know, money wise. It's a, I understand it's a business. Um, but then the people that helped build the business, you know, they were the ones like kind of, you know, pushed off to the side, but that's business. Right. And it's a lot different now. Um, Scott Demore does a good job of building the homegrown talent. You look at somebody like a Jake something, right? He went from, you know, nothing. And now he's like putting guys through tables and stuff like that. You know, I could see him being uh, that guy when we start going to back to, to live shows and, and fans in there where, you know, people are chanting tables for him. That's what I see for him. You know what I mean? And it just, it's, it's building your own home talent. And Scott does a really good job of that. Keeping everybody strong. Doesn't like, you know, okay, that guy's going to lose every single match for the rest of his career. Nope. He's lost too many times. Let's get a, a, a win on him, make him relevant again. And he, Scott's really good at that. Let me ask you this question. You know, obviously talking about the early days of TNA, you guys had created something that was very special. And a lot of people will look at that as very revolutionary, especially with the X division, especially with the high flyers, everything that you guys had done from a, an athletic standpoint, which in a lot of ways had not been highlighted or showcased. Um, how do you feel pretty prideful about being a part of the X division and something that really made a lot of people decide, well, you know what? I'm going to copy what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, if you look at just modern day wrestling right now, it's pretty much the X division. I mean, I feel like we revolutionized or helped revolutionize the wrestling business. Uh, the, what we were doing on TV back in the early two thousands, you know, WWE fans and WWE, you know, personnel, uh, management and stuff, they would frown upon that, say, oh, you guys are going too fast and you guys are, that doesn't make sense. And those moves are too big and you have too many big moves, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now you look at their product and they're doing the exact same thing. It's just, it's exciting. That's uh, the, the business has changed, you know, and now you got like moves that wouldn't make sense, uh, you know, back in the like eighties, nineties that are in there now. Like, you know, I, I, I take pride that I brought, you know, a, a video game move <laughs> essentially uh, to the business and was able to, you know, put it in, in mainstream. So, um, yeah, it, it's the, the business has changed and it's, it's going to be interesting to see what, what the next step is like, what, what's going to change now. Um, I don't know what else we could do, honestly. Well, well, Petey, you brought up the video game move, the Canadian destroyer. I got to know how to, how'd that move come about? No, it was just, uh, so I guess back in like when like Amazing Red was like, I don't know, eight years old, 10 years old, uh, unbeknownst to me, he came up with a move. Um, but Amazing Red came up with every professional wrestling move anyway. So, I mean, that's that we all credit to him. But, uh, you know, prior to YouTube and stuff, I was just we were driving me, Saban and uh, Truth Martini and Brian Gorey, a referee, uh, used to referee for Ring of Honor. We were just we were driving to IWA Mid-South show. Saban and I were going to wrestle each other that night. Um and then we were talking about like a flipping pile driver and, you know, we said, okay, let's do it. And he's like, do I give it to you? Do you give it to me? Uh, where, where do we put it in the match? How's it going to look like we, we have no idea what this thing's going to look like. We decided not to do it. The next month uh, I went down to IW mid South again, uh, ran into the guy that uh, nobody has heard of Matt Seidel. Um, <laughs> um, and then I said, Hey Matt, I got this new move I want to try. And he's like, okay, what is it? And I'm like, yeah, it's a flipping pile driver. And I didn't even know how to explain it to him. And he's like, okay, cool. Let's do it. I mean, <laughs> and, and we did it. And, and that was that, um, you know, you, you just <laughs> at that day, day and age in wrestling, or even like maybe five years prior, you, you don't even bring that up. It's like, no, that's too dangerous. You wouldn't do that. It wasn't like you were going like, Hey, I got this new move. It's called a diamond cutter. <laughs> and I'm just going to grab you and I'm going to fall on my back. You fall on my stomach, super safe, right? <laughs> um, no, it's like, hey, I'm we're going to flip in midair and, and you're going to land on you know your head. But I'll protect you. Don't worry. Uh, so just totally different. <laughs> Gosh, it's, it's so interesting now that you see so many people doing high-risk moves. Does it ever worry you about the how can we top this next type of thing happening? Yeah, and that's why, like, if you're – I'm looking at, um, you know – 
July 17th, that slam anniversary of an Ultimate X match. And it's been two years since we've had one. And I want to say uh, that there's like six of us in there. And I think only two of us have done an Ultimate X. So I know those guys are like going to try to steal the show. And it just, I'm excited. But at the same time, I'm afraid that, you know, somebody's really going to hurt themselves because that's what we do. I mean, there's been so many Ultimate X, X matches, so many great matches. Um, and uh, what do you do next? Like who, like I've seen Chris Daniels, like literally on top of, you know, the, the trusts that hold the X and jumped off into a dive. And so I see a, in a six sides of steel, I saw Elix Skipper walk the top of the cage yes. and do a hurricane run. Like this is just ridiculous stuff. Um, awesome. You know, it, it's, it's crazy, but it's like, what's next? Like somebody, well, people have been getting seriously hurt for a long time, but I'm just like, at, at the same point, I'm in the type part of my career where it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll do some crazy stuff, but you know, I also want to walk out of this match, like literally walk out of this match, not like be like, you know, on a stretcher or anything like that. How would you describe the PD Williams when you first walk into TNA to the PD Williams of today? How has the evolution of PD in your eyes been? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, I've matured a lot. Uh, you know, when I first walked in there and I've been totally honest and forthcoming, like, um, they pushed me to the moon pretty quick. I mean, I didn't even have, uh, I didn't even have my full work visa yet when they gave me the X division title, I had to give the X division, uh, championship to, uh, one of the refs, uh, to carry it around while I crossed back and forth across the border because I couldn't, I couldn't carry it. They would stop me and, you know, I'd be turned away, all that kind of stuff. And they just pushed me so strong, so hard that I felt like, and I'm young twenties and I'm like, man, I'm on top of the world. And then, you know, when they weren't doing anything with me, it just, it really, I had a chip on my shoulder, but then I just learned really quickly. I'm like, oh, this wrestling business doesn't owe me anything. Um, and so I know I've always did the, you know, I'm back doing, I've tried to do different characters along the way, but, um, you know, still the Canadian destroyer still doing like pro Canada stuff. And it's been 20 years. Uh, but also, um, I feel like I'm a lot smarter in the ring logistically as a wrestler. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm an agent producer in, in the back and I can help, uh, you know, the other guys that don't have a lot of TV experience or haven't had the experience that I've had. Um, and I really enjoy doing that backstage stuff as well. And, uh, you know, I look forward to running the company one day. <laughs> um, let me give, give you ask you this question. When it comes to some of the younger guys that are in there today, what kind of advice do you give them? Is there anything that you pull somebody aside and say, you know what, I can see their mentality. That was kind of the way I was back mm -hmm. at a certain point in my career. Do you ever say, hey, pump the brakes? Or do you ever say, hey, you might want to try X, Y, and Z? Or do you just kind of let them discover things on their own and then come to you? Uh, a little bit of all of the above. Like, I'm not going to tell, like, uh, you know, a Trey Miguel, Chris Bay, or Ace Austin, like, how to do a, a you know, a high-flying move. They're going to do it, like, 100% better than I am, right? It's just where to fit it, pretty much. Um, you know, just certain guys, uh, like, even the babyface comeback has changed so much, uh, you know, to, that it used to be. It used to be, like, bump and feed, bump and feed. Now it's, like, the guy doesn't even bump, but they're doing a flurry of like, you know, strikes and all this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, it's just, it's slowing down. Like it's a, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint, you know, like if you look at somebody like Josh Alexander has been doing this for a long time. He gets it, you know, he's our X division champion. Uh, you know, everybody loves his stuff and all that kind of stuff, but he's not going out there going hundred miles an hour. Uh, he can go fast when it counts, but he also knows how to make it real and stuff like that. Um, but and I, and I like for them to find out of things about make their own mistakes as well. Right. Um, when they're when we're putting together a match and they'll come up with ideas in my head, I might say like, "Are you sure?" And they'll be like, "Yeah, yeah." And I'm like, "Hmm." I'm like, "That's that's a good idea. I just don't know if it it fits in this scenario." But then I usually say like, "Yeah, let's go ahead and do it." I know I I do that because I used to hate it when my agents uh, back when I was younger would put the kibosh on my ideas. And I was like, man, I thought they were such good ideas. Uh, so I don't like to do that. I like the, to like, hey, if it doesn't work, hey, man, I let you do it. You didn't make it work. And, you know, I mean, I'm going to probably take some of the heat for it because I allowed for it to be on TV. But at the same time, 
I don't care. I mean, this is how we learn in the wrestling business. I mean, we shouldn't dictate everything to every person. It's make your own mistakes, go out there and do it. Um, you know, and I'll give you the feedback of why it didn't work or maybe how we could tweak it next time. It seems like a lot of wrestling, no matter who you've trained with or who's been your coach or whatnot, it's on the job training. You, you cannot simulate being in the ring in front of an audience working with somebody unless you just get out and do it. And it just has to be something that from a lot of people have told us, and including Jerry, um, it's, it's repetitive. It's repetitive. It's, it's learning from what worked, learning from what didn't work as well, and then going and modifying it from there. Um, to kind of, kind of add on to what you said before about what agents would say before, how has the agent scene changed from when you first walked into TNA versus where we are right now? Has the mentality and the leverage of the wrestler obviously gotten a little bit more say so, or is it more of a 50 50 or how does that work compared to when you first came in there? Um, it's not too much different. Like I, we've always had a lot of creative control and freedom in our matches. You know, obviously the time is uh, you know, we, we can't do anything about that. Um, and you know, the match itself structure wise, you know, they're, they're pretty good with it when it comes to the finish or certain things in the match that have to be done you know, they got to be done. We're telling certain stories. Um, it's changed a lot now because we used to film like once a week uh, or we would go live or whatever. And it's really hard to, or at the time, it was really easy to keep track where you are in the storyline and stuff. Now we're filming so far in advance because of, of COVID. Um, you know, our last set of tapings in May, we filmed all the way up until July. And I, I mean, I of the four days, I think I had like eight matches or something like that and like i age it in i don't even know how many matches and it was just like a big blur i remember doing uh something that swingers palace with tjp and i'm like all right uh so when are we filming this match next time and they're like no we did it on day one and i'm like we did like it, it's just it's it's mind-boggling to keep i like we literally uh, gotta like write a lot of stuff down to make sure that you know because uh, we film out of order and all that right. kind of stuff. So it is harder. Um, but, you know, we, we do give a lot of freedom to the talent because they know their characters, uh, you know, more than like they know what they would do as a character. And we're just, you know, putting the storylines in place and stuff. And a lot of the things happen are, are very organic. Like when uh, going back a couple years, when uh, Eddie Edwards uh, took the bat shot from Sammy Callahan. Oh, I mean, that was an accident, right? But, yeah. um, you know, uh, that turned into something and they still like have like a still people talk about it today and stuff. So things accidentally happen in the ring that organically grow into something else. And uh, to, you know, impact is all about. Yeah, let's go with that. The fan, it, man, there's something there. I, I've been in those booking meetings where it's like, hey, we have to scratch this idea that we had for Eddie and Sammy. And we got to build this together because we're on to something here. Do you feel like you look at the wrestling business different now, now that you're kind of on the management side and you're working with putting all of this kind of stuff together? It, was there ever a moment where you said, ah, I get why they want us to do X, Y, and Z? Or do you feel like as a performer, you always kind of had that idea in the back of your mind or did, did a light bulb go off once you started to do dual role? Uh, a light bulb went off more. I mean, my first uh scott knew i wanted to get an agent in uh in 2017 uh when he was still an agent and uncle jeff was still running the company uh the more had a lot of other stuff going on he was like hey you want to be you're talking about being an agent right and i'm like yeah and he goes all right uh will you get my match it's uh, uh desmond xavier versus matt Seidel." and i'm like yeah sure when's it up he's like other oh, next you got about three minutes and i'm like whoa and i'm like all right uh uh guys you know and they're like and i'm like what it dives and all this kind of stuff and that was my first like ever it's like sink or swim that's what it's always been for me in wrestling even my first match in tna i only had 20 minutes repair to go on live tv and th that's that's what it always is um but it has opened my eyes a lot of how you know it, it, it be doing dual roles now like just uh sitting in uh meetings with like jimmy jacobs and stuff and i'm like jimmy why aren't we going in this direction? I'm like, that that make that would be so awesome. He goes, Yeah, but if we do that, then we can't build to that, like, you know, in in a month away. Where does he go from there? So we like, and it's just a lot of these moving pieces that you have to have to keep in mind. So sometimes when people look at any wrestling product and they're like, Why aren't they doing this or why aren't they doing that? It's like, yeah, we'll get to it. And you know, like we just you don't want to ever book yourself in a corner. 
Right. And that's what I think a lot of wrestling fans and viewers, when they watch it, they're like, I could write a better show. I'm like, yeah, you could probably write a better one show, but try doing it like for three hours, a three hour show every single week, plus pay-per-views plus for like you know, specials. End. Exactly. I'm like, it's not as easy as you think. Well, let me ask you this, as far as, you know, bookers versus writers, I know that's always been a hot topic that people have talked about recently with WWE bringing in writers from all sectors of the world. And in the most recent story of the one girl who got a job and was told she didn't need to know anything uh, about wrestling, which once again, to each their own, um, I don't necessarily agree with that philosophy, but wh- how do you feel? Do you feel like in some ways wrestling is overproduced at times to the point where you're kind of taking away the creativity from the the guys and gals to the point where people can tell this is just way to a plus b plus c well i mean you know it's partially our fault as fans you know obviously i grew up a fan before i was a wrestler and you know what really drew you into wrestling you know i mean hulk hogan you look at him a hulkamaniac growing up i mean he all he did was take heat pretty much uh he did three punches a big boot after he hulked up and did a leg drop i mean that's not super exciting but like the stories they built behind it like yeah they 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 produced all of his segments as his you know say your prayers eat your vitamins and stuff like that and then it built up even in the attitude era with you know uh like the rock doing all his catchphrases stone cold driving to the ring with a zamboni like that's uh, that's super produced like that that's stuff that they have to practice like that's super produced so that's our own fault because you know, what happens? We get excited about that stuff. Um, as for the, you know, somebody that doesn't know wrestling, um, you know, you, you look at, you, I don't know all of Vince Russo's background, but uh, Vince, everybody's always said like Russo um, doesn't understand wrestling. Like he almost wants to take the ring out of there. Just like, we, we don't need a wrestling ring. Let's just tell stories. He's a great st- storyteller, regardless of what anybody says. You know, he booked the Stone Cold or he booked the Rock and Stone Cold. Like he knows how to tell a story. All right. Whether he's not going to put together finishes and stuff like that, that's going to be up to other people with with their brain. But I I feel it's okay if somebody doesn't understand wrestling. I wouldn't have them book the show from, you know, A to Z, but maybe come up with certain storylines and then get it in the right person's hands. And then they could put, you know, make some tweaks to it and stuff that it would make sense in the wrestling world. So, I don't know why everybody flipped out about that. Um, so, so what? Like you look at like, uh, I think it was Freddie Prince Jr. Like he's never stepped foot in a wrestling ring or been anything. And they hired him as a, as a writer because, you know, he's got that Hollywood background. Nobody said anything about that. As long as you have good ideas and, you know, it can be portrayed and people can relate to it as a wrestling fan and, you know, they could get into it and all that kind of stuff, then, any anybody anybody's a good writer i mean if you want to get steven spielberg or robert zemeckis or whatever down here to write wrestling nobody's going to say anything to them because they know they know how to tell good stories speaking of of people who have great ideas and can tell good stories in in your mind pd who are some people that you look at and you go man they just know how to put something together yep so i look at guys like uh like a sammy callahan not my style of matches stuff like that but um I always think like, oh, is it going to be the same old Sammy? But he always does something a little different where I'm still drawn into his character and his matches. He just, he knows, he gets it. He knows how to tell the stories in the ring. Um, You look at, uh, you know, even like a Josh Alexander. I mean, he's been around forever, but people are just starting to hear about him. And he just knows when it comes to wrestling, he's like, I would say like he's the new school Kurt Angle. You know what I mean? Uh, You know, he tells good stories. Uh, even moose moose has come a long way in the past few years man like he's he's uh, I, I see him as like a future champion obviously i think everybody does um even guys like uh that, that's just to name a few off the top of my head off impact uh you know aj styles when i used to wrestle him he knows how to tell a great story christopher daniels i loved it was so easy with him because i wouldn't even have to put any of my input in he, he would be like yep this is the story we're going to tell and it was always perfect um so i mean those are just to name a few the guys that i've actually worked with that i really like their storytelling when you originally got into tna dusty was there correct yep what was your thoughts on dusty um you know we often hear everybody portray him as being one of the 
really creative people um, mm-hmm. behind not only concepts for pay-per-views, but matches themselves. What was your interactions with Dusty? Oh, they were great. I mean, you know, Dusty, uh, when he got the book, he sat all of us X Division guys down and, you know, had big promises for us and everything. Uh, I think the the one thing that was working against Dusty is that, uh, you know, a, a lot of us guys in TNA uh, were like new to the wrestling world, like to the mainstream where people are, are just finding out who a PD Williams is or Sanjay Dutt, Amazing Red, you know, Chris Saban, Alex Shelley, that kind of thing. And we were just starting to, to get into it. And where I think it worked against Dusty is because Dusty, he probably knew who he knew from the past, like the Kevin Nashes and the guys he worked with in WCW, like uh, like Elix Skipper or something. I'm just throwing out some names here. Right. And he didn't really know the TNA product. Not, not that he should have, but he didn't really know it. He knows how to book wrestling, but he didn't know our product. And I think that's what really worked against them. And that, like, I, I don't think he knew... I think he was kind of learning as he went. And by the time they were like, yeah, we don't want him as a booker anymore. And when he was just starting to get his groove, uh, it was too late for him. When it comes to TNA, and then obviously it it kind of segues into impact wrestling. A lot of people had said before it was time for a fresh start. It was time to go ahead and do a rebranding. Do you believe in that concept of needing to move away from an ideology of a company into a new fr- new phase or a new area to go ahead and, and kind of give it a, a facelift? Or do you think that's just a bunch of words? Uh, it is kind of just a bunch of words, but I get what they're doing. Like when TNA came about, you know, when you think of TNA back when, you know, early 2000s, when Smut TV was a big thing with the Jerry right. Springers and all that kind of stuff, you think TNA, right? T yep. and A. Yep. So uh, th- I think they were just going for a quick, uh, you know, and streaming things weren't back then. Like you had to actually flip through channels or look through the guide. So they were hoping that they can get some eyes on the product by just saying like, oh, what is this TNA wrestling? Which I think was stupid because as soon as you turn it on, if you're actually looking for T and A and this comes on, uh, that person that was looking for the T and A, they're going to be like, I don't want to watch this. But right. I, don't, I don't know. But maybe they're like, oh, I like wrestling. I used to watch that. I'll, I'll watch this. So it, it was a, a big like, you know, uh, just just a grab, like a like a quick like, oh, what's what's T and A? Right. Um, but then, you know, when we start building up and, you know, getting a mainstream spike TV and stuff like they've talked about it before they actually rebrand it to, to impact It's like, we call, call, call us TNW total nonstop wrestling. It doesn't matter what it's called. Like it's our product. Um, but I get, you know, it was hard for Hulk Hogan to go up in a business meeting and say, yeah, I'm with this company called TNA. And they're like, what? And then he has to spend the first 10 minutes of the meeting, which everybody businessman, that's the precious time. Uh, explaining what it actually is and what I just explained pretty much. Um, so I think it was just easier for them to be like, you know what? Let's just call it Impact. That's our TV show. We'll call it Impact Wrestling, um, which is fine because now what does everybody want to see? Everybody wants to see TNA again. They're, they're like, hey, bring back the old TNA. And it's like, okay, great. Now we have somewhere else to go. <laughs> this is true. You mentioned earlier before about some of the more, um, I don't want to say well-known guys, but some of the guys from the past coming in. And I think what upset a lot of people, including myself, was the fact that the company was based upon the X Division and the young guys in the next generation. And we have moved on past some of these older guys. And I think that turned a lot of people off. Did you guys realize that within the company backstage that it was about people like you and Joe and AJ and Christopher Daniels and Kazarian and everybody else? That's what we wanted. And then when all these other guys came in, it, it was kind of like, we've already seen this. Did you guys kind of catch on to that as well? Like, eh, this isn't going the way we wanted it to go. Yeah, but I mean, I don't even think it was about us or the bookers. I think it was more about like the TV executives. They're like, okay, I don't know who Samoa Joe is at the time. I don't know who AJ Styles is. I know who Kurt Angle is. I've heard of him. I know who the Dudley boys are. I heard. Of, I know who Sting is. I heard of them. So it's like, all right. I mean, you know, we, we got to put these guys on TV, you know, they're, they're big draws and that's what the, you know, the advertisers, all the business side of it, that's what they want to see. Um, and I, it, it's really tough because TNA at the time, they really had to be like, okay, we still have to focus on the X division because that's our bread and butter. That's what people came here to watch and, and they're homegrown people, but we also have to do this for the TV executives. And it's just a big political disaster at that point. Um, but we like, I remember being excited when all those guys came in, you know, uh, 
do I think they utilized them right? Not 100%. I look at a place like Ring of Honor at the time. They would bring in the big names like uh, Jeff Hardy or, or whoever. And they wouldn't have Jeff Hardy go through the entire roster. He would get some wins and losses. He, he They utilized his name and his big you know main event status to help elevate their talent. Right? And that's what it should always be about helping elevate your own talent. So when, you know, and Kurt Angle, I love, I loved when Kurt Angle was there, he ended up being like the face of impact for forever. I thought he did a, a better job there than he, for the most part, maybe, yeah, maybe did in WWE. Um, but you know, when Samoa Joe's on a hot streak, it's like, ah, I, I really didn't want to see Kurt Angle be the one to end Joe's hot, like his undefeated streak i should say it should have right. been like you know somebody everybody wanted to see that match uh but i think it should have been somebody like a, a local guy that they could have pushed like a younger guy or whatever the case may be so but you know not my company not my tv show i don't make the calls i just you know i it's really easy to armchair quarterback all this stuff um but you know when i look at when I look at how they, how they booked them, like, I don't think they should have just went through the, all of the entire roster. I think they should have had to struggle and I should have, I think TNA at the time should have did more to elevate their, their local guys, um, you know, by getting the rub off of those, those big stars. I know we're pushing up against the clock here, but just a couple last things I want to touch base with you is um, wrestling today. Is there anybody that stands out right now? Let's put the hat on as the the producer and the agent. Is there anybody right now, you know, you mentioned some few names before here about like Josh Alexander. And mm -hmm. is there anybody that you look at right now and you say, man, that is going to be a player in a very short amount of time? Yeah, I already mentioned Moose. Uh, you know, Moose just, uh, just re-signed with Impact, I think, which, uh, you know, I, I, so I don't, even though I'm behind the scenes, I don't, I don't deal with any of the contract signings or anything like that. I don't know when anybody's contracts are up, but you know, just looking at Moose, I thought he was going to leave. I really did. And that just goes to show how much Moose like likes impact and having, you know, that, that creative control that he has, because he's definitely going to be a big time player. Uh, I see somebody like a, uh, like an ACE Austin, you know, give him a little bit of time. He'll be the next AJ styles. You know, that, that, that's what I believe. Um, you know, he just, there's a couple little things that he's got to do. Um, you know, even Chris Bay, you know, I, I was just wrestled him on TV last Thursday and, and he'll be a big player. I mean, I'm looking at like years down the road, but keep an eye out for those guys. Those guys are going to be big. Obviously the guys like currently right now, like, you know, you got the, the Kenny Omega, you know, I, I do feel I, I've been in the ring with him uh, several times and, you know, I do feel like he's uh, eh, maybe not the best in the world. One of the best, you know, I mean, that's all, but, yeah, I, I would say those obviously Kenny's a big time player. Um, and at Impact, those are a couple guys that I'd be like, Yeah, yeah. And I, I would have said Rich Swan like maybe a year ago, but you already seen what he's I, I pinpointed when I knew he was gonna get his impact, uh like his his push and impact. He went through this whole gauntlet thing and just he was the MVP of that gauntlet, and I'm like, dude. Rich Swan man is at another level. So he already took it there. And I think any of those guys I just mentioned, they're just waiting for that one opportunity where it's like, man, that that's it. They're going to be pushed to the next level. Let me ask you this. What is your personal favorite moment of your career so far, whether it be impact TNA, whatever you want to call it. Is there a moment that you can, you can look back on fondly? I, I've asked this question to Jerry before and, and, <laughs> To get a straight answer out of him, he says, well, I like them all. And well, yeah. what do you feel? Is there a moment when you felt like Petey Williams was, man, this was it right here. I, If I top this, it's going to be very hard to do. Yeah, I remember uh, a very emotional, I mean, there's a couple, but a very emotional time was uh, the first ever monthly pay-per-view uh, with TNA. I wrestled AJ Styles and, you know, I, I was carrying the exhibition title for a while. AJ's on all the posters and stuff, the poster boy and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, obviously he's going to win and stuff like that. Like, but uh, they didn't have it that way. They had like their top guy lose to me. And I was like, oh, and it just like, that was such a big moment. Cause we actually switched to monthly pay-per-views. Uh, we were one of the highlighted matches and you know, it was, it was a very, very emotional after the match. Uh, just when it all sunk in, I remember with Scott, we were hugging and, uh, you know, 
Eric Young, the, all the team Canada was, was hugging. And, uh, you know, we actually, like I was crying, Scott was crying. Bobby Roos said, you guys are assholes. You're going to make me cry. And then he left. Um, so, I mean, that, that was a big one. I don't, I don't know why it's just, I mean, it's, it's not about wins and losses and, and getting the belt and stuff like that. It was just where, where we've started and Scott being my trainer, know where I've started to where we were at that point. Like we were on top of the world and it was just, it was so amazing. Uh, another one is when I, I came back after I retired for a little bit in 2017 in Ottawa and I was in a six man X division match. And, uh, you know, just when I, I, we were in Canada and just when I came out, like the, the place like just erupted and they're just, they sang my whole song, like the whole national anthem and Sanjay, who was the writer at the time was in the match. And he was just looking at me going, you know, Oh my God, PD, this is, this is effing awesome. It's oh, oh my God, this is effing awesome. <laughs> like we weren't even worried about the match or anything. And he actually came back afterwards. He's like, man, I should have had you win the belt that night and we could have just <laughs> took it off you at TVs. And I'm like, yeah. So th there is certain things that I, I fondly remember, uh, you know, and th th those are just a couple of highlights of that, that I'll always cherish. What's, what's next for you? What's the next chapter? Um, yeah, I, I'm going to, uh, probably, uh, make a move for, uh, you know, running impact. I mean, geez, I, everybody wants to be world champion and stuff right. like that. I'm like, no, uh, you know, I, at first I'm like, okay, I would love to be, uh, you know, uh, the head, uh, like maybe director, but Dave Sahadi so good at it and stuff. Uh, but you know, he's not gonna be around forever and nobody's going to be around forever. And then, you know, maybe the, the executive, like the head producer or whatever. Um, but then I thought like, I mean, I could, I could probably do those jobs. I mean, not as good as them, but I'm like, why not do something like an, you know, an EVP or something like that? I don't know. I just, I, I try to have higher goals and stuff like that. So they're more non in the ring related. Obviously I still like going out there, like, you know, Chris Bay, who's like probably old enough to be his dad. Uh, I, I probably not, but, um, I, I just like going out there with those guys. And you know, my big joke is, uh, when I get to the back and people are like, yeah, PD, good match. I was like, yeah, that's how you let somebody carry you through a match. Um, so I always make that joke that, you know, these guys are carrying me through a match, but I, I like that, you know, secretly, I like that I'm able to keep up with these guys. It's good. It's kind of like when I used to wrestle against Jerry Lynn, you know, I think Jerry Lynn liked that he could keep up with a young, you know, a, a young 20 something year old. So, uh, yeah, what's next for me? I'm, I'm obviously planning on sticking around with impact, um, wrestling, producing, whatever else. Uh, obviously I, I got my own podcast, um, and thanks for having me on ours is called the wrestling perspective podcast we do it with uh dennis farrell he's our our main producer and host uh darren mccarty from the red wings uh dimitri young uh used to play for the tigers and cincinnati reds yes and, and uh lars uh frederickson from the band rancid so um yeah i mean we're, we're on fight tv you can see us uh, uh every friday eight o'clock i think we have a show on mondays at eight central or eight eastern as well on youtube anywhere you get podcasts stuff like that uh, we're actually doing TJP tonight. I think on Friday drops Taylor Wilde. We just had like, you know, uh, Punk on. We just had Joey Janela after he made uh, that big ruckus down in Florida. He came on our At podcast. The board. That. Yep. So he talked about that. So that was interesting because I didn't understand it all, but he actually explained it in detail for a good half hour of, you know, uh, how that came about and why he did that and all that kind of stuff. So if anybody wants to check that out, you know, uh, by all means, you can, uh, the Wrestling Perspective podcast. Last thing I want to ask you is if if there's any way you could do this, go back in time and take someone out of a match and drop you into the match. This is a question that my co-host asks. Um, what match would that be? Hmm. Oh man. I've never ever ever thought about that. Like I wish I was in that match. Um Cause a lot of the times I'm like, huh, these guys are tearing it up. I'm glad I'm not in that match. <laughs> uh, I'm like, I'd probably stink it up. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, I, I guess recently I'll say this one just because I've never done a full one hour one, you know, I, I would have liked to gone one on not, no disrespect to TJP who we also have on our podcast tonight. Uh, but I would have liked to go one-on-one -on -one in an Iron Man match with Josh Alexander. That would have been, I would have been so exhausted but just something that, you know, uh, in recent memory that I would, ah, oh, I, I wish that was me. You know, I'm glad it wasn't, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that'd be cool to do that. I tell you what, Petey, we've enjoyed your time. You've been so gracious with it. I know we've gone over, but um, 
thank you so much for not only talking to us today, um, but sharing all the memories. And for all of us who are hardcore TNA people who loved it from day one and we watched it and we fell in love with what you guys created in the X Division, something that had never been done before, to look back at now and, and getting a chance to talk with one of the originals uh, means a great deal, not only to myself, but our audience. So thank you very, very much. No, thanks for having me, guys. It was a, it was a blast. Thanks. All right, guys. Follow PD on social media as well. Where can they follow you on Twitter? Uh, right there at the bottom of the screen right there at IPD Williams. Uh, I got uh, Instagram uh, on it. Same same handle, but uh, I you know I'd have to get better at uh, posting the pictures. And then anywhere you listen to your podcast, you can uh, you know find us at uh, the Wrestling Perspective. That sounds awesome. PD, any chance we could twist your arm to come on back again? Oh, absolutely, man. Awesome. Thank you so much, PD. We'll talk to you down the road. All right. See ya. All right. That is PD Williams. Um, really great conversation with somebody. Like I said before, when we were talking to him, it's one of those situations where when you see somebody and you get to watch what they do and you get to see how much happiness it brings to them. Um, it's great. And then years later, getting a chance to talk to them and, and relive some of those moments and those stories, that's the icing on top of the cake. When you're a, when you're a broadcaster or a podcaster or whatever you want to refer to us as to get to have these moments is priceless. It truly, truly is. So follow PD on uh, his podcast, follow him on social media, all the different platforms. Uh, the writ himself uh, had to uh, step out of the interview, but we're definitely going to chat with him uh, and get kind of a, a recap of what his thoughts are as well. But for now, I'm Mike Freeland and we will catch you next time. This has been a special presentation of Front Row Material.